this this particular topic refuge is so interesting because um usually western buddhists or buddhists that didn't grow up in buddhism approach the idea of the spiritual path with a lot of intelligence and a lot of critical thinking and also maybe some scars and some baggage from their previous spiritual tradition maybe with a lot of assumptions about what religion is or isn't. And so um, this particular topic, you know, is intellectually quite easy to understand. But in terms of your own personal experience, it can go very deep and it can touch a lot of stuff and heal a lot of things as well. So um, I'm really looking forward to um, talking about it with you guys and hearing what your ideas are what your insights, what your challenges are. So I thought that we would start with just a little exercise to see if we're on the same page or not and, you know, what what things need to be adjusted. So I'm going to put a little sheet up on the screen and I want you to just kind of think about it. Don't think like it's a test. It's not a test or a quiz, right? We're not in school. It's more just kind of an invitation to reflect. Okay, so when you're looking at this, first just ask yourself, in Buddhism, and for me personally, they might be two different things, but what am I taking refuge in? What am I taking refuge in? And just kind of sit with that reflectively. Is it external? Is it internal? Is it some combination? Is it an ideal? Is it a person? What is it exactly? What am I taking refuge in? And you can write down a few thoughts if you like, or just sit with it. And those refuge objects, for lack of a better word, why have I chosen them particularly? Because why? Yeah, refuge because they are, it is what? What makes these things or this thing or that person or this path something valid to take refuge in? And then I'm taking refuge towards what, to what end, for what reason, in what direction, refuge towards what. And refuge from what? What am I trying to move away from? Or what am I trying to transform into or out of? Where is the danger? Or the confusion? Or the lack of security? Why do I need refuge? What is the point of it? What is the benefit of it? Why refuge in the first place? This whole premise. Okay. Um, does anyone feel like uh, sharing? Um, what? Okay. What do Buddhists take refuge in? Whether you're a Buddhist or not, whether you take refuge in it or not, what are what are Buddhists taking refuge in? 
the three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. Nice. Very nice. Go team. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, no, that's the classic. We've got to start there because otherwise yeah. it's hard to have the conversation, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and, yeah. And why those three? What, because why? You know, what makes them a valid source of refuge, do you guys think? At least from the Buddhist perspective. Why do we think that those are reliable? We could start with the Buddha. Okay, what, what makes the Buddha a reliable or valid person to listen to and to take his teachings on board and to feel supported by his community? What about him do you think, we think, makes him reliable? So maybe because he's free from fear, because he has nothing to fear. He has eliminated all the reasons, all the... All, all the negative states of mind, he has nothing left to fear. So therefore he's this perfect. Exactly, perfect. yeah. <laughs> Just remember, <laughs> yes. So the, the question is, what, who, what do we normally take refuge in? You know, like you think, okay, yeah, the Buddha, he's fearless. Um, he's able to, you know, control his mind. He's speaking from a place of such compassion, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, that's someone worth listening to. But what do I normally listen to? What's like the wrong refuge? Yeah, there might be many, many good refuges. But, you know, what do we actually take refuge in on a daily basis to self-soothe, to make us feel relaxed and content? You know, what do we normally do? Just kind of sit with that. Yeah. Could be an easy one. Food could be yeah. one. <laughs> an exactly. easy one. I mean, that could be an easy, of course. Yep. Then the more extreme intoxicants, you yep. know. Yep. Yeah. Stuff. Stuff that makes you feel full or feel relaxed or feel comforted. You know, whether it's food or intoxicants, as you said, whether it's um, a certain t type of person, whether it's a certain type of interaction, um, you know, a certain place, a certain temperature. Um, but there's a, there's a certain amount of kind of craving for sensorial relief, which is very human, you know, it's very human and natural. And it's not like it's bad. It's just that we're giving all the power to the wrong thing. You know, it's like, yeah, of course, food is necessary. We have to eat. And if you eat too much, it's a problem. And if you eat too little, it's a problem. And if you look to it to be your best friend, it's a problem. But we do need it, right? We can't just say, oh, well, I'm not going to eat food then, you know. Um, but the question is, what power have we given to it um, to give or take peace of mind? Um, when you're coming from a craving mind, you can ruin the thing that normally works. Right. For example, if you're um, eating your favorite food, maybe it's a cookie. I love chocolate chip cookies myself. If I'm having a craving mind, I could take one bite of my favorite thing and already be anticipating the end of it and the next one before I even finish that bite. So I've like I've lost the joy of it, even though it's supposed to be something that works. Yeah. If I'm not coming from a craving mind or a less craving mind, um, I can have that bite and eat the whole bite and be really happy with the whole bite and maybe not even need to finish it. Do you know what I mean? You know that headspace, whatever it is. Um, it can be the same with something like music. It could be a song that always brings you such joy and peace of mind and you're really sad that day and so you listen to your song expecting it to fix you and you get through the first verse and you're like, next, 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 next. Yeah. Um, but if you're in a really happy space and it comes on, you can just kind of drift into it and feel really kind of absorbed and merged with it and happy um, because you haven't put so much pressure and expectation on it to fix you. So the problem is, is that because these things sometimes work, they're hard to shift your habit of reliance. You know, if music never worked, if food never worked, we're not stupid. We're not going to like use things that don't work. But um, because they work, we have this assumption that the peace of mind we find from them as conditions is actually a cause. And so then we rely on them. We take refuge in them when they are unreliable. 
the only thing about these objects that has given us pleasure has been our own opinions and state of mind in relation to them. You know, like if cake was delicious and uh, happy making from its own side, you could eat it all day and never feel unwell. You know, it would just give you continuous happiness. You could listen to your favorite song on repeat all day, and maybe some songs you can listen to repeat all day, but could you listen to it constantly for months without anything else? Eventually it would turn into suffering. Yeah. You know, your best friend or your partner or the object of your attachment, you know, you could think, oh, all I need is them, <laughs> you know, and spend the whole day with them. And think of one whole day with one other person. You know, one whole day with one other person, you go through all these different shifts of closeness and distance and highs and lows. We're connecting over this plan. We're disagreeing over that plan. We have a shared opinion here. We have a disagreement there. And it kind of, it goes like this, just through the course of one day, never mind the course of the whole relationship. And yet our attachment mind finds that one moment where it all came together and there was joy and says, this is them. And any time that they're not living up to that, there's something wrong with them or there's something wrong with me. Rather than just seeing it for what it is, which was there was a moment in time where all the conditions came together for things to synchronize. Yeah, for you to be conditioned for each other's happiness. And that's lovely, but it wasn't really about either one of you. You know, it was a whole series of conditions, right? So what we normally take refuge in is not reliable. And so we're constantly chasing and disappointed and disillusioned and dissatisfied. And, you know, you really can get into this feeling of there's just something wrong with the world or there's just something wrong with me rather than thinking maybe I'm taking refuge in the wrong things. And so the real refuge from a Buddhist perspective is not the three jewels. It's the Dharma that you've integrated because that's what actually protects your mind. So it doesn't have to be the Buddha's Dharma. It can be any quote Dharma that leads your mind out of negative states into positive states, which are the actual causes for your happiness. And so what protects you already is your own mental resilience. What gives you safety and security already are the life lessons you've already learned. Yeah, your common sense, you know, the, what you've seen of the world. If someone's very angry, you know that there's suffering behind it, that suffering people aren't, <laughs> you know, aren't necessarily rational. So if they say horrible things, you think, oh, they must be suffering then it doesn't disturb your peace of mind. You know that because you're an adult, you know? Not because, you know, someone injected you with truth, you know? So the Buddha's wisdom, he doesn't have the copyright on it. And he never said that he did. And I think that's one of the reassuring parts, right? Is that the Buddha never said this wisdom that I merged with and integrated and am teaching you, it's not mine. It was there already. I'm one of many teachers who has come to clarity about it. I'm teaching some methods for you to access it within yourself. So what gives you actual protection is what you have really digested, like a healthy meal, making you stronger. That makes sense? So, so we'll go through these and, you know, just kind of, kind of keep an open mind, but also, ask yourself, okay, I don't need to be Buddhist, but maybe I do need some sort of spiritual refuge. You know, I don't necessarily need this Buddhist spiritual refuge, but when I look at refuge, what has not worked <laughs> and what has worked, right? So we were asking the question, what am I moving toward? What am I moving toward? What am I taking refuge toward? Um, to what end? Basically, like, what is the meaning or the purpose of my life? And, and I think that there's a societal illusion that the meaning of life is just going to magically reveal itself to you, that you have no role in finding it. There's that kind of lie out there. You know, maybe on your deathbed, all will be re revealed. 
And, you know, I don't know about you, but I've been with people as they've been dying and lots of people never figure it out. And it's, it's poignant, you know, it really, it breaks your heart, their whole life chasing something, thinking that it will just magically tell them, here's your purpose. You know, and, you know, a lot of us come to the realization that the meaning of life is the meaning you bring to it. The purpose of life is the purpose you bring to it. But what kind of criteria do you think is kind of universally true? You know, what is the point of all of this existence and life? Is it procreation? <laughs> you know, I'm going to say no, but it could be. It could be. Um, is it what? Is it hedonism? Is it just to like get happy, get happy, you know, try all the different things that make you happy and just consume like an animal? If we were an animal, maybe that would be okay. Because when animals live that way, they don't hurt anything. But when we live like animals, we destroy. So we can't say, all right, I can just be an animal because I'm just an animal. We're not, we're human beings. So what is the meaning and purpose? Maybe something about happiness, but maybe not hedonistic consuming happiness, maybe deeper happiness. Does anyone already have kind of a framework of what you say your purpose or your meaning is? It might be something to do with your work or your family or your mentality. It can be a secret, but if you want to tell, yeah, please go ahead. Hello. Hi. Um, hi, and very nice to meet you, and sorry I'm late, but I have family here, and they're just about to leave in half an hour back to the UK, so I've just kind of jumped on for half an hour, but it's very interesting hearing what you're saying, and I've like got a million questions, but I know we don't have the time, but um, it's very interesting you saying about, because I I, w I want to have, my, I keep saying to my husband, well, what is it all about? What's the point? <laughs> yeah. And he says, he says, just to live, just to live, just live. You know, I've always said to Miriam and Evan, my husband's got it all sussed, really, you know, and he doesn't follow the Buddhist way. But he, you know, he, and, but I, for some reason, want yeah. To find the the meaning, you know, and then, and yeah. I don't know why my mind keeps trying to find that. I, I I feel I need a purpose. I feel I need a, a, that some of my, my <laughs> hi darling. I feel I need a purpose. I feel uh, I need an 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 answer, and I think that's why I'm going down this path. Yeah. And it, I mean, yeah, it sounds like for him, do, living is enough. I, yeah, but for yeah, you, but do it I mean really more. need? Do I need a? Do I need a reason? No, what, I want to. Hold on, she's upstairs. I want to go. I want to be as good a person as I possibly can be, and I want to help people as best I can be, and I, and I want peace of mind. Mm. And, I, yeah. and I feel that's 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 it. Yeah. I want yeah. It to be, I don't want to be do stuff for me. I want to do stuff for other people. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and um, yeah. But well, sometimes. I mean, ask yourself um, this question. Ask yourself, oh, if I'm on my deathbed, and I'm and I and I'm awake and lucid, and I know that I'm dying, what will I be so happy to have done? And what will I think I wish I had done less of? You know, like right away, you know, I really am not going to be on my deathbed thinking, I wish I'd watched more Netflix. You know, you're not going to have that, like, right? That's not going to be one of your regrets. Um, I wish I'd had more arguments and really held more grudges and really made life more difficult for the people in my life. You know, you're not going to think that, right? Um, you know, but what will you think? I'm so happy I've done that or I'm so happy I was that. You know, it's a, it's a really good way to kind of find your purpose is to imagine it's the end already and to look back. And what do I think now that I have life left? What should there be more of? What should there be less of? 
you know, so you start at the end and then work your way back to where you are. And of course, death could come today. Um, but to, to kind of keep that in the forefront of your mind of, I perhaps already have found my meaning and my purpose, but I haven't articulated it or told myself about it clearly enough, intentionally enough for it to feel forefront in my mind and to drive my daily life with, um, you know, the richness and the joy of it. You know, so, so a lot of it can be just kind of untangling all of the fluff all around and all the noise and distraction around and coming back to the essence of who you've been so far in your life when you've been joyful and connected. You know, maybe the meaning of life for you is friendship or family or love, you know, or altruism being of benefit. And you already knew that, but you hadn't really spoken it to yourself and clarified it and then made it an intention that you try to live by. It was more an occasional thing you touched into when you had mental space. So when we're trying to um, access refuge or spiritual refuge, a lot of it is to do with what is my meaning and purpose in life and how do I bring it forward rather than have it incidental in the background. Because then you feel more connection with it and you also feel more depth building with it. You know, you become more powerful within that space when it's right on the surface of your mind. You know, so, um, and it also could be that you're not sure what your life's been about so far. You know, you know that friendship and family is something important. There are things about your work maybe you enjoy and value or not. <laughs> you know, there's things that have been important, but were they important enough to be purpose? You know? And you don't have to have all the answers, right? The question being wide open, what is the point of all this? That open question makes you live a more meaningful life than I'll just get through this, you know, and try and take what happiness where I can find it. Because that is the way most of us live is I'm just trying to get through this and find some joy on a day-to-day -day basis, not thinking of the long term of this life or the legacy you're leaving for all the human beings after you. And that's why the, cl the climate is as it is. That's why the planet is as it is. That's why politics is as it is, because people are just trying to get through the day and take immediate gratification rather than go to the depths, rather than empower themselves to realize that your state of mind is a critical element in finding mental peace and in finding deep purpose. You know, so it's understandable, but you know, yeah, go ahead. Sule. Hi, hi, Venerable. My name is Shule. Um, initially, uh, the reason I first took refuge was because all that chaos in my mind, uh, it, I needed to clear out because like you said, I had no idea about my purpose. I'm still not 100% sure about it, but initially it was to sort out all that chaos. And as time went by, it's only been two years for me, I noticed that I work, I work in high school and I noticed that quite a lot of the teenage girls started to imitate and copy me. So I was working, trying to work on my anger. I calmed down. They didn't even know I was angry. They think I never get angry. <laughs> but they, they started to um, copy me. And um, a lot of them started meditating, even though I'm not very good at it myself yet. But I saw that they were, um, they were looking at me as an example. And that, made, that spurred me even further to try, to try harder. Um, I'm not the best of students, so I try to show myself a lot of compassion and kindness. But yes, initially it started with trying to get rid of the chaos. And now it feels like I actually have a purpose. It's a mixture of showing young children um, a way. There's a different way. They don't have to react to everything mm -hmm. around them. And also, obviously, to try and get out of this repetitive cycle of what we call life. I just wanted to share that. Yeah, yeah. No, that's beautiful. And, and I think it's, it's really important what you said about knowing that you're not perfect, but doing it anyway. Um, I, I think that that's one of the greatest things that we can offer other people because Buddhism can sound like such a trap because the goal is to become perfect. Like what a trap. That's horrible. Who wants to live like that? You know, like you were living that way your whole life and it was failing and that's why you found Buddhism. And then you think, no, they are the same, you know, and it's, you know, it's the journey, not the goal, right? All these cliches, but 
you know, I think that when you're, you've got a sense of humor and you've got self-honesty and you know that even practicing imperfectly is still useful, that is some of the most empowering self-knowledge and also makes you so much more useful to the people around you because they're not assuming that they need to be perfect in order to practice either. And, you know, I don't know about you guys, but once you start getting into a spiritual path, it can be a little bit confronting for your friends and family, even if you don't talk about it very much. And they might start saying, oh, you're pretty angry today. You're not being very Buddhist, you know, and they might start kind of picking at you a little bit because they see that you're on to something. You know, you've touched something a little bit more deeply and they want to, they want to touch something deeply, but they're scared or they're lazy or they're whatever. And so rather than try and meet you where you are, they try to tear you down and that's human and natural. But if you're too much thinking you have to be perfect, what that does is make you defensive, you know? And then you think I have to prove that it's okay to call myself Buddhist, or I have to prove that I'm a good person, or I have to defend this or that when really, if you can have a sense of humor and say, isn't that funny? Here I am a Buddhist and I was so angry today. Ha! Ah, hypocrisy. You know, if you can laugh at yourself, then there's some space and they feel like they haven't lost you to this path. You know, that's something so delicate that, that they don't feel like they've lost you to this exotic new thing that actually what this exotic new thing is doing is bringing your heart closer to the surface and even more accessible to them, not less. Do you know what I mean? And so refuge gives you that inner security that's not afraid of being wrong and is not afraid of being imperfect. And it's, it's, it's like you can almost rest into the comfortable armchair of your refuge and things don't get to you because now you have a point and a purpose, but also you have backup. Yeah, you have like someone holding you, something holding you, even though it's coming from the inside out, it feels like the outside in, yeah? Because of course the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha exist. And of course, what do Buddhas do but try to inspire you to move your mind in a positive direction? So we're being helped by enlightened beings all the time, whatever you want to call them, but we don't feel that help all the time. Yeah, we don't always feel it. Why? Because we're not open to it, you know? So a lot of connecting with refuge is actually opening yourself up to all the floods of love and floods of compassion and insight coming to you from these previously enlightened beings. But it's also opening yourself up to hear your inner guru say, I've always known this was right and I've always known this was wrong. You know, I've already, I've always known that I need depth in love and depth in compassion. And those are important motivating forces in this world. I've always known that. And now I'm giving myself permission to go more deeply into that. And I'm giving myself permission to let go of some of the surface refuges that have never really helped. So it's not like you have to suddenly, you know, become a nun or give up some sort of relationships. It's that you're giving up a type of reliance. Yeah, you're not relying on other people to be stable because people are not stable. <laughs> so if you're spending your whole life trying to find a stable, secure situation, a stable, secure person, and then you can relax and then you can do whatever, your whole life is just going to race by. You know, people are not reliable. Situations are not reliable. You know, who are the people in your life every day? You know, try to see them for who they are today, not who you hope they'll be, not who they used to be. Just who are you today? How can I enjoy you and you enjoy me today? Because they are a new person, even if they're the one that you saw yesterday. You know, so if you kind of give them a chance to be new, that can also make life richer. Yeah. So the other side we want to look at is what are we taking refuge from? You know, we talked about what we take refuge to, good or bad, but what are we trying to like get away from? 
um, or a change or, you know, disengage from? What brings danger to our life? Or what brings sadness, anger, et cetera, to our life? What's wrong with life, <laughs> I guess, is the question. So if you were to think, what are you trying to take refuge from? What do you guys think? So all the negative states of mind, all the delusions, everything that gets us into trouble. <laughs> yeah. Everything that brings all the problems, all the agony, all the anger, all the irritation, uh, all the suffering. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Trying yeah. to eliminate all that as much as we can, as much as we can. So that's the, like, the right answer. <laughs> What's what we actually think? When you think, I just need to get away from, I just need to get away from, what do you say to yourself? I have to get away. So I say I have to get away from this country. You, if, boss, <laughs> if you think you're being, you know, you're being targeted or something at work, there's a stressful yeah. situation. Oh, you know, I just, I don't want to go to work today. It's really stressful. I have to see this particular person again. I can't believe it. And he's, you know, he's a department manager now. <laughs> oh, that's even worse. How am I going to, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. Can you imagine all the inner, you know, all the inner, wow, the anger, the frustration. How can I, how can I manage that? And yep. just have that manageable inner me with yeah. as much as possible more peace yeah more balance stability you know? nice to meet you too it's an honor to be with you um for me it's um really the unhappy inner me and my mind yeah and um, taking you know a refuge in things to give my mind a rest and uh my inner Side. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of the time we're running from ourselves. <laughs> we're trying to take refuge from ourselves or our own train of thought. Um, a lot of the things that we do take refuge in is because we're running from our own internal stuff, isn't it? Like, it could be that, um, especially you see it with teenagers when they're looking at their phone and they're just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling it's not like they're happy all the time. Like sometimes they see something and they stop and they laugh and they're happy for a minute and yay, whatever. But sometimes they're just like mesmerized in a trance and it's not like they're enjoying it, but they can't stop. And sometimes we as adults get into that too, although luckily we didn't grow up like that. But we, you know, we can get kind of spellbound and mesmerized even with a novel. You know, you're just reading a book that you enjoy but you're not really enjoying it and you're kind of reading it a little frantically. And it's basically just, I don't want to hear my own thoughts. So I'm going to stay busy with something, you know, this one, right? So I'm going to do something, whatever it is to crowd out my own internal thoughts. And then on days like that, you get to the end of the day and you get into bed and you lay down and it's like your brain is buzzing like bees you know, just trying to settle down. And you might even try and, um, I don't know, sedate yourself into sleep without having to hear those thoughts, whether it's through sleeping pills or alcohol or marijuana or Netflix or whatever it is, you try and kind of drown out your own thoughts. Even in that last moment, when you finally hear what you're saying to yourself, it gets so overwhelming. You're like, no, you know? And it's really human. It's such a human thing and very universal and not talked about that often. You know, we talk about how to relieve the symptoms of it. We don't talk about the cause of it. You know, we're like, you could try this, you could try this, try a natural remedy, try St. John's wort, try melatonin, try this, you know, um, try to do some, I don't know, Epsom salt bath before you go to sleep. Lavender's great. Sure, but why are you like that in the first place? You know, why are you like that in the first place? And so it's not terrible to do symptoms relief that's healthy, but more, I think more important is to ask, why am I so agitated or why am I so dissatisfied? What did I expect should happen? What did I want to happen that didn't? 
what am I saying to myself that is like an act of self-harm? A lot of the thoughts we have to ourselves and about ourselves are like whipping ourselves for being for not being something or for being something. And that is a fundamental problem that we talk about a lot in Buddhism because you're assuming that your afflictions, your negative states of mind, your delusions, your bad habits, you're assuming that they are you. And then you're terrible for having them. Yeah? When in fact they're just habits that you developed because they made sense at the time and they made sense from the perspective of your innate ignorance. They made sense from the perspective of your self-cherishing indifference to others, which everyone has. And so you develop these crazy habits that don't work, but everyone has them because everyone has the same innate ignorance. So you're not bad, you know? But a lot of what we're trying to do is block out the feeling of being bad or being wrong or being stupid or not living up to something. And um, I think it's so helpful to really change the way you think of negative states of mind, delusions, afflictions, etc. Try to think of them like if you had a little like skin cancer on your arm. Yeah, if you had a little skin cancer on your arm, you know, you're like, oh, that freckle's looking weird. Oh, no, it's getting strange edges. I better go to the doctor and get it checked. And the doctor said, oh, you've got some skin cancer there. We better cut that out so it doesn't spread. You would say, oh, great, thanks. Yeah, let's cut it out. Do it. Right? And you wouldn't think, I'm so bad for having skin cancer. I'm such a bad person. I should have never gone in the sun. I should have never had Irish ancestors. Oh. You don't think that, right? You just think it's skin cancer. It's not me. Get it out. But it's made from your cells, you know. But we don't get that silly idea that we are our skin cancer. We just say that's a disturbance in the natural pattern of things. That's something that will make me unwell. That's something that could spread. So I better cut it out before it takes over. You know, and that's the same way we want to think about anger, the same way we want to think about pride and jealousy and attachment is it's arrived here through many causes and conditions. And it's living here in my mind. And I can take responsibility for it without saying I'm to blame. And they're two different things. It's like I'm responsible for it because it's here, but I'm not bad for having it. So you kind of give yourself a little bit of distance, you know, just a little bit of space that says, just because I feel it doesn't mean it's mine. Just because I feel it doesn't mean it's true. Yeah. And then getting rid of those sorts of things just becomes a project like uh, cleaning the house, you know. It just becomes like, I don't need those boxes anymore. I'll take them to the recycling bin. You know, you're not bad for having extra boxes in your house. It just accumulated over time, <laughs> you know? So um, what we're taking refuge from, of course, should be, as Miriam said, negative states of mind, delusions, etc. But what we're actually kind of running from is all of these angry thoughts or these attached thoughts that we have about ourselves, we're trying to escape by suppressing them or blocking them or navigating around them rather than uprooting them. Does that make sense? So, you know, that brings us to kind of the last point in the thing, which is um, why do we need refuge to begin with, <laughs> right? Why? Yeah, well, because we're not happy all the time, are we? And maybe we could be, maybe we could be. So also why? Because we hurt ourselves and we hurt other people sometimes. And maybe we don't even mean to, but we do. Yeah. So, um, so I'll put that back up, that little um, scroll back up so that you can have a look at um, what, you know, see what is clear for you and then what isn't clear yet. And then we can talk about it a little bit after the break. But basically, okay, so you guys got it. You nailed it. <laughs> Refuge in the three jewels, right? Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Because they are reliable, we go to refuge toward positive states of mind, 
from negative states of mind. Why, and here's the clincher, and maybe Miriam talked about it with you, it's called fear and faith, which are such religious terms that immediately you go, oh, yuck, yuck, Buddhism, please, no more of these words. But uh, they mean something different in Buddhism. Okay, so we'll come back to the fear and faith, all right? So fear, healthy fear, in what your untamed mind can create. Yeah, if you don't take the reins, if you don't take control of your mind, it will destroy your happiness and it will make you hurt other people and life will be less fun, <laughs> right, etc. But it's healthy fear in what your untamed mind can create. Try and remember the, the hours and weeks and months and years that you have lost to sadness or to anger, to jealousy, to pride. Allow that to make you a little bit apprehensive that you're not going to just naturally get better through aging. Some people do. Some people, when they age, learn their lessons, learn the lessons of life, and gradually mature and gradually get wiser. And that's an opportunity that we all have as we get older. But not everyone takes that opportunity. I'm sure we've all met older people that have not learned their lessons well and just get stuck in their ways and just keep being unhappy and just keep making the people around them miserable. We might turn out like that kind of person if we don't take some control over our own mind state. So just a little healthy fear that says, I'm not gonna just figure it all out naturally. Now, it's not going to just come naturally that I figure out life. I actually need to be proactive in this investigation. So then you have faith, which is based in experience and logic. And that is Buddhist faith. We're not about blind faith. We're about faith based in experience and logic that gives you like a conviction of truth that the three jewels offer tools to save oneself from suffering. Yeah, so you save yourself. The three jewels just offer tools that you can take or leave, right? So refuge from negative states of mind because they can lead to destructive actions of body and speech, harming others as well as oneself in the future. Refuge from creating negative karmic seeds which ripen as suffering. And also negative states of mind lead to repetitive habits and dissatisfaction. So we turn to the three jewels to help us break the habit of negative states of mind so that we stop suffering. So intellectually not hard, right? Intellectually easy, practicing difficult. Yeah, yeah. intellectually easy, practicing difficult. Um, yeah, slowly, slowly. <laughs> <laughs> as we say in Buddhism all the time. But this concept of fear and faith, even though they're very icky religious words, if you can think, it actually can motivate me to be a little concerned about what my mind is like on a bad day. We usually identify with ourselves on our best day, in our best version. You know, think of yourself when you're your most patient, your most loving, your most wise and expansive, and then you sort of draw a circle around it and say, that is me, right? And then when you don't live up to that, you feel crap about yourself. You know, you don't live up to the best version of yourself. You think you're being horrible, right? That's what happens. So thinking that you are the best version of yourself can lead to a type of pride which actually leads to depression. Yeah, so you have this like exaggerated sense because you are that person occasionally, but it creates an unrealistic expectation which makes you constantly disappointed. And then you feel bad about yourself. And then you can get defensive um, and arrogant and try and prove that you're really that person and mad at people who don't agree that you're really that person, yeah? When in fact, you know, if you think of yourself on an average day and kind of place identity there, it's a bit more reasonable. And then when you quote, perform well, you're just like, oh, great, <laughs> rather than, of course, that's who I am, you know. 
Yeah, but the thing is, is we want to look at also how are we on our worst day? You know, how are you when you have committed to a mood? Yeah, when you had a bad mood, you woke up grumpy or whatever, and you let it get its teeth in. Yeah, not you didn't shake it off. It got stuck in and you believed it now. And now the whole day, you believe your own sadness, you believe your own anger, you believe your own disillusionment, and nothing anyone can say can change your mind. Even if they say things to you that you believe, it just annoys you. You're like, shut up, <laughs> you know? If they'll say, you know, compassion's the most important thing, you'll say, shut up, <laughs> even though you believe that compassion is the most important thing, yeah? Um, and so this healthy fear is based on thinking we're a little out of control on our worst day. We might still have enough control to be polite. Maybe, <laughs> maybe not, right? We might have enough control to like manage paying our bills and getting groceries and doing normal human things, but we don't actually have control on a bad day to get ourselves happy once you've really gotten lost in it. You know, on a medium day, on a good day, the bad mood can creep in and you can shift yourself out of it. But on that day when you've committed to your mood, there is no choice. You're just stuck there until it finishes. Do you know those ones where you just, that's what's happening today. You just feel absolute crap. And so to have a little bit of concern that those days, we'll just keep coming and they won't come any less unless I take some um, opportunities that the Dharma affords or some opportunities that psychology or some other different ways of thinking afford. I'm not going to grow out of my bad moods. You know, <laughs> I grew out of them to a certain extent after adolescence, but then the adult bad mood level doesn't necessarily get much better unless you try and do something about what started it. Yeah. And the key things that start a negative state of mind are based in a misunderstanding of who you are. Yeah, who you are in relation to others. We, we have this ignorance that thinks that we are like a permanent little core that adds experiences to it. You know, that there's like this tiny part of ourselves that's been exactly the same since childhood. And we've just added some memories and some experiences and things on top of it. But really, we're the same person we always have been. That's one part of the lie or one part of the mistake that we always have had. The other part is an illusion of separateness, of independence, that who we are, we created all by ourselves independent of circumstance. You know, you think, okay, who am I? Who am I? We'll start with your name. Did you make your own name? <laughs> Probably not. Your parents gave you your name. Maybe you changed it at some point, or maybe someone gave you a new name like me. But your own name isn't even yours, <laughs> right? Even if you're, um, you know, a groovy hippie who made your own name, it came from somewhere. It came from some influences. It came from some ideas. There was collaboration involved. It's not you or yours, but it landed here, you know? And you can go deeper. Think of your personality. Maybe you like your intelligence or you like your sense of humor or you like this or you like that all of which were learned yeah they weren't self-creating and yet you feel like they're you it could be that you're very angry it could be that you're very depressed those aren't you either those are just habits that accumulated here do you know what i mean and so if we can break the initial problematic way of seeing ourself, then a lot of our suffering starts to just give up. And what's left is happiness. What's left is peace of mind. And the really good news is your mind in its natural state is actually very calm and quite content. It's just gotten so much extra stuff to agitate it that we don't access that peace and that contentment very often. 
and we also aren't sure how to develop it e into even deeper forms of happiness because there's just too much chaos on the surface. Yeah. So if we can start with who am I, not who I think I am, <laughs> right? Who am I? A label on a series of parts and experiences that I have responsibility for, but are not me. Yeah. Every one of your qualities, every one of your faults dependently arose. They weren't self-existent. So that means you can just enjoy what is good about your personality and your qualities and think, isn't it great I can do that? I'm so glad I learned how. And the things that are problematic, you can think, oh, that's really unfortunate. I learned that from somewhere and it's just not working out well. But there's a little bit of space then which means you can change what's not working and you can reinforce what is, but there's that spaciousness that's not taking your life so personally. We'll go back to then this screen here and just look a little bit about taking refuge to then. So we're taking refuge toward positive states of mind because they can lead to beneficial actions of body and speech, assisting or soothing others as well creating positive karmic seeds, which ripen as future happiness, typo, lead to repetitive habits and satisfaction contentment, can be fully developed into complete Buddhahood enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, and positive states of mind are what actually protects you from suffering and the causes of suffering. Okay, so we'll just kind of unpack that a little bit. Just take a minute and think about a day that you were wanting to help someone else without a lot of expectations. You know, something where you didn't have a big agenda to be recognized. You just saw, okay, they could need some help and I can help. Maybe your friends were moving house, you know, and they were stuck and they had the van there and there was only two people putting boxes into the van and you thought, I could help. You know, I could bring pizza, or I could bring drinks, or I could carry something small, or I could pack up some fragile things. And it just occurred to you that you could be helpful. You know, just like take some situation like that, where it just occurred to you, you could be helpful. And you spent the whole day doing something helpful, not needing appreciation or validation, just really satisfied that you were useful. At the end of that day, what is your mind like? You know, imagine yourself like sitting on the edge of the bed, taking off your socks. <laughs> you kind of like, ah, that was a nice day. And the mind isn't really chattery or busy or frantic with anything. It's just kind of quiet. And you're in that just kind of peaceful quiet of, ah, that was a good day. And you sleep well. This is showing you that having a positive state of mind is good for you, <laughs> right? It's good for you to think of others without expectations. It's good for you to have a really altruistic mindset. You benefit from that. Now, of course, the person that you helped also benefited, but you being motivated and oriented in that way protected your mind from suffering. Maybe if you had to do that same exact task just for yourself, you might have gotten impatient. You might have gotten bored. You might have felt all by yourself and alone. You might have any number of kind of afflictions could come if you had to do the same exact thing, but just for yourself. Yeah, and at the end of the day, you'd be like, oh, I finished. That was rough, <laughs> you know, but you don't have the same kind of like joyfulness necessarily. Sometimes you do, you know, but just kind of think of some examples of how thinking in a compassionate way has made you steady and clear and happy. Yeah. Not when like attachment has creeped in saying, look at me being good, then that will ruin it, right? <laughs> that will ruin it. Look at me being good. Someone should really recognize that I'm good and tell me that I'm good. You know, then you ruin it for yourself, right? But um, those really open-ended days, sometimes it comes easily with animals or with small children. 
Yeah, because you don't have the same pressure on them to tell me that I'm good for helping you. You know, if, if a friend just like hands you their crying baby, you're like, okay, crying baby. Okay. Now, you're not expecting the baby to say, thank you. You know, you know what babies are like. So you just pat and you're just present, you know, just okay, honey, it's all right. Being alive is hard. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, and, and there's some sort of peacefulness that can come to you by being present with them. You know, or you see a stray cat, you put out some food, they're happy, you're happy, it's happy, you know. So taking refuge in positive states of mind can sound very like sugary, sweet, and yucky. It can sound like self-help manuals. It can sound like pop psychology. You know, it can sound like not what's useful because sometimes it's oversimplified. Yeah, but use your own memory, you know, use your own life as, as proof for what type of positive state of mind. It's not just be happy in a kind of frantic, plastic American way. I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy, the world's going to hell, I'm happy. You know, it's not that, right? It's not fake, plastic, absurd, happy. It's that deep happy, you know, it's contentment. And we've all touched it somewhere. And, you know, again, the problem can be that we take the situation where it worked, and then we think it was about that situation when it was about the mind we brought to that situation. Yeah. So if you can use the situation to like key you into that headspace and then just let go of the details and be like, that's the headspace I need. Let me just keep coming back to it again and again. It gets clearer and clearer and stronger and stronger. Then we'll go to the last little bit and then have a break. So here's our, here's our kind of summary piece. So the three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, we want to really see it as the Buddha is like the doctor who just says, here's the problem. Here's the illness. Here's what's going on for you. Here's a prescription here. Now you take it or you don't, you know, you just trust that this is someone who has studied and understood systems better than you have. So they're worth listening to. The Dharma is the medicine. So it's really like you could have the medicine in your hand and it's the total cure. But if you never take it, it's never going to make you healthy. So, so the Dharma is the real refuge that we want to look at. The Dharma is the medicine that will make us better. And the Sangha, whether it's the relative Sangha, you know, monks and nuns and the community, or the ultimate Sangha, Arya Bodhisattvas who have realized reality directly, Basically, what we're talking about are people that can help you with side effects. <laughs> side effects and symptoms and dosage. So f take, for example, um, a retreat. So you might think, all right, this Buddhism is fun. I'm going to do a retreat for two days, just two days. And you sit down and you start meditating. And it's way more meditation than you've ever done. And you start getting tired and you start getting bored and you get impatient and you start beating yourself up and a whole set of things happen. And your Sangha can say, that's quite normal. And you go, oh, okay, that's quite normal. Okay, I'm not bad. There's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with this. This is just part of the process. Yeah, and they can say, why don't you try sitting with one more cushion <laughs> or one less cushion? Why don't you try not drinking tons of water right before you sit down? Or why don't you try this or that? And it's easier for you. So your Sangha is really helping you manage the everydayness of your practice because they're people who are either at the same level as you or just a few steps ahead of you, maybe many steps ahead of you, but not like finished. So they, they, they recognize where you're at. You know, and they say, just watch out for that section. It's easy to go the wrong way with it, or it's easy to misunderstand this. So, you know, nurses are amazing. They get a lot of work done. It might be like in a community like yours that you don't get a doctor type teacher very often, but you get tons of nurses, lots of nurses. And you actually get a huge amount of work done with nurses. 
Yeah. Nurses do most of the work secret, right? <laughs> so if you can get a doctor every once in a while to give you kind of the essence and the pith and, um, you know, the cleanest, clearest medicine, your community and your kind of baby tea teachers can help you with dosage and side effects. Yeah. But this analogy of doctor, medicine, nurses only works if you recognize that you're sick. Yeah, it only works if you, like Alcoholics Anonymous, recognize that you're a little bit out of control of your own afflictions. Sometimes you have control over them and sometimes you really don't. You know, there is an illness which is curable. And it's an illness everyone has, so don't worry. But, you know, we're a little bit unwell with negative states of mind and ignorance. It's making us unwell, mentally and physically. It's why we have uncontrolled birth, aging, sickness, and death. If we didn't have that, those things would be under our control and they wouldn't be suffering. You know, so just sit with, okay, yeah, I have amazing potential. My mind has amazing potential and I'm a little bit unwell with my negative states of mind. Both things are true. Yeah. You can never destroy your potential. You can never destroy your potential. You can destroy the illness. So it's just, you know, it's okay to think of yourself as a sick person because it means you can become a well person. If you think you're already a well person, why would you listen to any advice? So the Buddha, as, uh, as Miriam said, is reliable because free from fear in the sense of the Buddha no longer has the fear that comes from the illusion of separateness. Yeah, the fear that comes from feeling alienated or suspicious of other people because there's a deep understanding of the interconnectedness of everything. Yeah, there's no more fear that comes from being angry or proud or attached because there's not a sense that you're going to lose anything. Yeah, and skilled in freeing others from fear just means that the methods are taught. And the last two are really important. Um, if you're looking for refuge, but you don't want to call it Buddhism, yeah, if it's some other spiritual refuge, look for these last two. Make sure it's unbiased, impartial, yeah, meaning that there's no chosen people, yeah, or some people that get the goods and some people who don't, yeah. If there's a religion or a spiritual tradition that says these people are special and these people aren't, that's a little bit problematic. Yeah. Um, and I tease my Jewish friends about this a lot. I work in Israel sometimes and I'm like, okay, chosen people, <laughs> let's talk about it, you know. And, um, and I can tease them and they're saying, no, 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 it's about, you know, God gave these people responsibility to do certain things. It's not about us being, bubble, you know, so we have fights about it and it's fun. But um, if you're looking for a spiritual refuge, just make sure that there's not some sort of weird cultiness that happens. And probably your alarm bells will go off, but occasionally there's just a little bit of, we are very, very special here, that make, should make you go, uh-oh, no good, yeah. And is the refuge object or person or path something that can actually lead you to the development of your fullest potential or not? You know, have they gone there themselves? You know, you're not going to go get a guide for the Himalayas unless they've already been there. You know, you're not going to hire a guide who's never been where you're going. So So again, the real refuge is the Dharma you have individually integrated. The real safety is from your own wisdom. You get safety from your own wisdom, from your own compassion. That's what gives you safety. That's what gives you real refuge. So that's, that's just summary.